You're good to go, Justine. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Justine Cucci, and I'm the chair of the Battery Park City Committee. And today is November 4th, and we're having our meeting. Um, my co chair is Kathy Gupta. Um, we have Jeff Myhock on, on the line. We have Betty Kay. We have Bob Schneck, Jeff Galloway, Jeff Myhock. I didn't say that already. Judy Weinstock. And I think that is our board. Um, Robin's going to come on late, and I'm thinking Sarah's coming, but she may be late too, so we'll just keep an eye out for her. But we want to get started, and um, as everybody knows, I don't think we have a whole lot of people on the line that aren't us, but um, we have a Robert's Rules, so um, the board, our, our, our uh, panelists will go first and ask questions, and then we will look to the, to the attendees, so raise your hand when you want to say something, and I will try to pay attention. And as uh, Lucian is making a note to please sign in, that would be great if you can do that. Um, and I think we can get going. Maybe we start with the seniors. Oh, so so let me say the order. So if you want to go to the um, agenda, please. All right. So we've got stuff shaking it up now. Kathy had a really good idea, and Patrick, I see you're on, and I think you'll like it. We want to do every other month where you go first or almost first because we've got Marianne Braverman presenting today about the seniors group and she needs to get off the call early. So I want to let her go first, but then you're up. So for the first time in, in, in a long time, you get to go first and then we'll talk. I'll talk with you and then we'll do just to give an order. So it'll be Marianne for the seniors. It'll be Patrick. It'll be the Gateway Plaza tenants dis discussion. Then we'll go to Nick's report. And at the end, we will talk about um, from Lucian will give us a little bit of an update and inf information about 421A and 421G. All right, so go ahead with that. Marianne, take it away. Okay. Um, I am Marianne Braverman. I have lived in Gateway in uh, Battery Park City since the first day Gateway opened. Um, and in recent years, I've become a member of the steering committee of the Battery Park City Seniors. So first, for everyone's enlightenment, I'd like to explain what Battery Park City Seniors even means. It is basically an email list, a list of people who are interested in knowing what's going on and uh, from the perspective, I should say, of a senior. So we don't have rules about an age or a requirement. Uh, if you think you're a senior, you're welcome to join us. Um, so, using the list, we put out programs and activities for seniors, and through that list and through attending programs and activities, seniors develop relationships. Um, the mission of the seniors, Battery Park City Seniors, is to foster ongoing community engagements by providing educational, social, healthful, and recreational programs and activities that support the independence, health, and well-being of older adults. Um, now, if any of you have seen our, our email newsletters that go out, we cover uh, health talks, we connect people with uh, fitness activities, and we've worked a lot on developing senior activities, fitness activities that will um, keep people moving physically and um, not have to pay much, if anything, for them, so that anybody can feel free to join us and attend. We work with any agency and resource we learn about and can get any help from. So uh, the community board website and messages are very useful. Uh, um, our assembly member, our state senator, any information that comes our way. Margaret Chin uh, particularly has been a very big support over these years because she has a, a special focus on aging. And uh, the Gateway Plaza Tenants Association, and uh, especially the Battery Park City Authority, since this is where we most of the members of the committee live. We do not restrict it uh, based on geogra geography. People could live anywhere downtown and come join our programs, which is kind of the spirit of Battery Park City and the parks. 
you can join us no matter where you live. On um, as far as other programs and resources that are that are uh, available to us, we will take information from a group called Senior Planet that does a lot about educating seniors on using uh, the web and using computers. They also put out senior programming. Uh, a group called Next Door, and uh, one of the key things that Next Door did this this year was that their members got online when COVID began and said, we're young and healthy. We're working from home downtown here. Does anyone need a delivery? Does anyone need something picked up? Uh, they, they just, there was an outpouring of that. Is that and that neighbor's email group? Yeah, it is. Okay. It is, yeah. So, and you know, again, it, it hits different neighborhoods with different topics. But it was clear right away that there were people who were ready, willing, and able to assist. Um, there are also some senior programs, senior centers, I'll call them, like Greenwich House and Hudson Guild. And we will grab from their newsletters things that we think might be of interest to our people. Now, to put all this together and relate it to COVID, when COVID began, there are five members on the steering committee. <clears throat> and we were just gathering information, pushing it out. We were sending, we normally do a new, one monthly newsletter and then maybe sort of something mid month to catch up on some new things we heard about. And we wanna let people know. We were sending out messaging every, every other day. You know, here, here are grocery stores that you can go in early and, and just be among seniors and not among other people. So you have a little better opportunity to shop and stay safe. Here are places to get free food. And if you need food delivered, uh, there's a city program you can sign up for. So some people financially can afford food, but they may not be capable of getting out there and getting, uh, getting food, bringing it home, cooking it for themselves. So, uh, you know, something like Meals on Wheels is useful for people who might have an issue like that and need help. So uh, we were just pushing information out until we kind of, uh, and I'll speak for myself personally, I was like exhausted. <laughs> and I kind of said, I got to back off a little and uh, give myself a little bit of a break on this. But by then, most of the things that people needed to know was out there. Um, so, one point I'd like to make is that our funding, we're, we're not a senior center. Like, uh, centers exist, they have a physical space and people come to them and it's a very structured program. It's only volunteers who are running this and keeping this thing going. And we used to get a small amount of funding every year for Margaret Chin. I guess it's that extra money that some of the council members get that they can distribute throughout their district. Well, uh, it's never very clear to us any year if we're getting the money, although we're invited to submit bills and get money back and so far so good. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a lot more concerned and I'm sure other committee members are as well because of the status of money this year in the city and the state. So we, we may be a little more hard up going forward because we paid for things like to have an art art person come in and do art lectures and actually the very last group activity we had before the shutdown was an art lecture um, and literally the next day everything stopped and we were sort of like wasn't it great we at last had that lecture <laughs> because you know you get a smattering of people who just listen and then they talk among themselves and it's that social opportunity that seniors need. So um, to get closer to a conclusion, um, we, we try to mediate, you know, as well as telling people what's going on, we try to mediate on local issues. So as a quick example, there was a Tai Chi class one Friday morning when a cavalcade of boats came in, making a lot of noise, disrupting the class. And so, you know, I got involved in that to try to be sure, not only that, I mean, it, it got resolved, but I also wanted to be sure people knew in the future 
what can they do? I see your lips moving, Justine, but I can't hear you. Should, should I be hearing Justine? And you're hearing me? Yeah. Now I do. Wait, I did for a second. Is there something I should do or not? No, 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 now you're back. We, now you're I've heard you the whole time. Good, so with me, I'm sorry. Okay. I interrupted you. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so for example, I, get, I gather tons of information about the marina and activities that are permitted and not permitted. And I put that out in the next newsletter so that if people feel there's something happening that's not right, this is who to call first and this is who to try second and third and so on. So we, what we're trying to do is be a, a, a source of information to seniors. I tell them periodically throughout the year, this is the security office number for Battery Park City Authority. So Patrick, I'm always telling them that they should put your number, not your personal number, but the department's number, in their phone. So if they have an issue when they're outdoors and they're worried or upset or something's happening, they can quickly call and get through to one of the ambassadors in the office who can who can help them out outside. Uh, so I, I'm always looking for possibilities versus policies. Like here's the policy, we do this, we don't do that. Well, let's discuss possibilities. And uh, one of the things we're talking about now is transitioning we had sitting circles outside during the nice weather. When seniors would sit out on a Friday or a Tuesday afternoon, little groups here and there and keep everybody going and uh, socialize because it's so important for people who live alone. And as the weather's getting colder, how can we transition to something inside? so that you know people won't lose that they got through the worst of COVID in the beginning when sort of it was new and everybody was in in good spirits about it then we ha had the chance to be outdoors more and i don't want that to just cut off now that it's getting colder happily you know this week we're up in the 60s again i think we can sit out on friday but we we really want to move towards continuing this through the colder weather in a safe way um and and that's probably all i have to say that i need to say so if anybody has questions ideas um we get a lot of we got a lot of input from the gateway tenants association during uh covid also to share things so we're always looking for uh resources and access that we can share among all the seniors Thank you. Thank you so much for, for uh, presenting that and giving us that information, Marianne. And thank you for what you're doing for the seniors during COVID. Have you had any issues or had any um, people who've needed help who, who we've not been able to help? Or is there anything that can be done? Not that came forward to me. Okay. There's always sort of a, a concern that there are people we're not reaching. But okay. maybe they're just not our audience. That's possible. And I, I don't know. I, I always invite people to reply to what we write. And there's very little response. Okay. But people show up for things. So I, I, I don't always know how to gauge that. But um, I'm not hearing anyone say, I need help and I can't get it. Another thing, I'll just brag the, about this a little, was that uh, we put out a lot of information about doing the census and voting. And uh, we were able to find out that you could drop off an absentee ballot at 32 Broadway. You did not have to go all the way to Barrack Street if you didn't want to put it in the mail. And a couple of people did that and they were pleasantly surprised because that had not been publicly put out. But we did have, Justine, you were in on these emails even with uh, Ms. Doty from yes. the election board. And yes. so people could go very close by yes. in their ballot. And I personally did it for me and my husband. Yeah. So, um, and they were just lovely there. So yeah. it helped people out to be able to to have an easy way to, to be close that. and not wait on those four or five hour lines because right. I was there. Right. All right. I see that Sarah raised her hand and said. Me? Can I ask a question? In your audio cutout. I don't know why. Thanks, Lucian. Uh, 
No. Can you hear me? I, I hear you. Cool. Yeah. Um, what time do your um, outside groups typically meet? Um, oh, the sitting circle that we do? Yeah, 2 30 in the afternoon. Okay. And we're kind of near Gateway out on the Esplanade where there's often a breeze, which is good to blow anything away that's hanging okay. around. Um, and we've been doing that on uh, irregularly Tuesday and Friday. Are uh, you, are, if if it's possible to do it in a, um, you know, everybody masked and everybody separated? Um, I know that Gateway has a party room that's unused. Do you want me to approach them about that? Um, possibly. Yeah. Okay. It's it's in the gym. The gym is reopened. Okay. There's also a room in back that clearly there are not going to be any parties in. Right. Right. Uh, so I'm happy to approach them on your okay. behalf. That's helpful. Uh, thank you. That would be you great would. to just test the test the waters there. It, yeah. It's it it wouldn't it shouldn't be hard. And the the other is um. There's a a room in um the district, whatever they're calling it right now. Okay, oh, yeah. Approach them about maybe using that room just for what you're doing. Right. And also I will put out there that Nick Spordone is looking at the community room uh, oh, in two hundred director okay. as a poss possibility as well. So yeah, thanks, Kat Sarah. Yeah, so we, okay. that's good to have more options. Yeah, thanks. Did you get a reply from Nick? Um, you've got my email, right? Yeah, I do. I do. Thank you. Okay, please hand down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Kathy, you go. Go ahead. And my sound is going in and out, by the way. So if you, if if I am speaking and hearing myself, excuse me. Sure. I have a few questions. Um, give me a sense of how many seniors are members of the group. Well, we have uh, just under 250 people on the email list. Sorry, 250? 250, yeah. Wow, okay. Uh, they are, I, I know that they are not all actively reading the emails. So at some point, we'll try to do some cleanup. That's what we have. And what were the types of services or needs that, that were most commonly asked for during the, the height of um, the crisis? <laughs> well, people don't ask us. And there's almost no one saying, I need this, I want that. We, we just pushed out newsletter items, letting people know about safety, about food, um, stores that were having special senior hours, anything that our elected officials were making available, we were, we were putting back out. Um, our borough president has had a lot of information, but people do not typically reach out to us and say, I wish we would do this or that. Um, one, the dining club. I can't hear you, Kathy. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of maybe people said, I need somebody to go pick up my prescriptions for me or something of that nature. There was one person who once needed, and this wasn't related to COVID, but she needed someone, you know, if you have certain medical procedures, they won't let you go home unless somebody's there with you. And um, <clears throat> she'd asked if we could find somebody, um, which would have been doable, uh, although it's not typically something we, we do, but then she, it worked out somehow. And so, uh, and I will even say that there are people through this people they've met at exercise classes, for example, who've become friends and who now do these things for each other, which they may not have done. You know, they may have been more alone about these things in the past. So, uh, so that's been a positive over time. 
question is always how can the community board help? Um, at this moment, I don't know since we're still in COVID and most people have made the arrangements they need. Uh, it's not something we're concerned about. As we get out of COVID and we want to start to have maybe programming that may cost something, um, you know, we may need ideas for sources of funding. If the city pulls back on what they've been funneling through Margaret Chin, for example. Um, but right now, you know, there's not something I'm I'm asking for. There's nothing I'm asking for. I'm just here to let you know what happens. What the scene is about. Uh, more for information. Oh, and one last question. Do you anticipate any special needs around the holidays, especially since we can't be together with our families? Right, right. right. You know, before COVID, I would love to have a Thanksgiving dinner or a holiday dinner year end for seniors who are otherwise alone. But I don't think this is the year to start that. Um, a lot of people have children who pick them up and take them to family gatherings, but there definitely are people out there who, who do not have anyone to be with. And after COVID, I'd like to find a way to make that happen. So. Okay. I just had one quick question. This is Jeff here. Um, is there any way to any place? Is there any way to, to obtain and then place to store or use these like heating lamps that we see restaurants using? Yeah. So that see, uh, did I miss something? We already talked about this. I don't, yeah, no. uh, a place where we could designate a spot where seniors can sit out together under some lamps with blankets and be together. You know, into the chillier months. Um, sure, sir. I don't know. I mean, it's possible that a restaurant like Miramar, there are two restaurants, one beside the other, right on the South Cove. I don't know if maybe if we brought our own heating lamps, if we're meeting at 2.30, that's not really mealtime. They may be happy to let us sit outdoors with some uh, at some t empty tables and bring our own lamps and stay warm. Or, you know, people are willing to wrap up as best they can just to have that, that time together. So yeah. that's that's I'm I'm glad you thought about a another outdoor alternative. Um, so thank you. I was thinking more like a place where they could be stored that is not a business that if there's any budget to buy a couple of them and then I don't know about that courtyard up near um, Gateway. Um, right. Uh, or maybe right outside the uh, center. Um, where we have our meetings occasionally up across from the Irish Memorial or somewhere where they can be taken out, assembled, and some chairs put up with some blankets and some heaters and a place to sit. Well, we, there, Battery Park City Authority does rent that uh, space in 200 Rector. And outside of that space, it's under, an es under the yes. coverage, the arcade. Yes. And we could... You know, have because actually the authority has given us some storage space in there. So yeah, for senior stuff. Uh, you know, mostly related to eating and so on. But um, yeah. if we could run a line outdoors and and to have some chairs outside, that might be a way to stay outdoors and uh, sit and visit, or perhaps even use the community room. In, in some small groups too. Yeah. So uh, that's in Nick's court at this point to see what's what, what we could do indoors, but outdoors is a great idea as well. Thanks, Jim. All right. Well, I do have to go, guys, because it's off to the fields for a soccer game. I'll stay well on the floor. I'll see you all next time. All right. So, right. Can, can you hear me? Or no. <laughs> Okay, really quick, everybody. Hi, this is Lucian. Um, we.
we had to uh, watch our microphones. Uh, a lot of some people have speakers on sound feedback loop. It's really horrible. Um, I'm noticing that WebEx has rolled out a feature where if you're muted, um, you can hold down the microphone. It'll tempor temporarily unmute you. You can speak and when you put your hand off the microphone, it'll remute you. That's the best way to do it and prevents horrible, horrible sound feedback. I try to hunt and, and close people's mic down when I when I hear it. But um, so if you see you're, you're muted, um, that's because there's some sort of sound issue coming from your microphone when you're not speaking. So don't take offense. I'm just doing it to manage sound. Okay, that's it. I'm out. Back to you, Justine. Okay, sorry. I was I had called in and I don't think anybody could hear me talking. Um, I wanted to thank Marianne. Jeff, goodbye, but I think you're gone already. Sorry, I was actually talking. <laughs> Um, I, I do think, Marianne, that Jeff's idea is amazing because I think being inside, I'm sorry, outside is better than being inside. Um, so this is going to be a fun meeting with me not hearing. But anyway, um, <laughs> it comes and goes, the hearing. Anyway, but thank you very much. Um, next, I think um, if, if there's no other questions, I don't see any. Um, people are going to have to help me out with waving or something because I don't see anything in any questions in the attendees. And uh, that's it. I don't see anybody else. So thank you, Marianne. And um, there we go. Well, just um, next, I uh, think just... we will then jump to Patrick. Patrick, are you there? Hello, I am here. Thank you, Marianne, for the uh, push with the telephone number for the security office. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, looking at October's numbers for 2019 and 2020. Uh, graffiti in 2019, we had nine cases. In 2020, we had two. Homeless in 2019, we had 21 reports. For 2020, it's at 14. Lost and found property. Uh, we had seven in 2019, and in 2020, we have four. Park rules, in 2019, we had 58. In 2020, we have 69. Uh, vendor solicita uh, solicitor, we had 24 in 2019. We have two in 2020. Dealing with dogs, in 2019, we had 46. In 2020, we had 27 reports. So that completes the uh, report. All right, Patrick. So what I would like to do going forward is, and, and I'd love the committee to, to jump in and I'd like to hear from you, but I, was, I talked to Nick a little bit about it. And um, in this, I'd like to get some, um, my way of saying is I want some substance behind the report. I, the numbers are good, it's, but we can see the comparison by looking at um, Nick's report, the last page of his report. So when he does that, it's there. What I want to know is, okay, so we had some um, uh, situations with the homeless. I, I have questions about the homeless in our neighborhood. How do does the, do the, do the um, Ambassadors, have they made contact with them? Do they know who they are? I um, mean, there are some pretty uh, regular people who are around. And I'm not, I don't know that you can answer me today, so that's okay. But I want to give you an idea about the different things um, that I'm looking to see. You know, you talk about some other incidences where there's, um, gosh, like, like last, I think maybe this was for the last meeting, but whatever, where, where there were people on a scaffold um, by Brookfield and the scaffolding fell, but thankfully the people were saved. That's an, of interest to say, okay, this happened. It was okay. The, no, no glass fell. No people on the ball fields were hurt. Um, you know, whatever, if it, that was even a remote possibility. Stuff, am I, am I making myself clear about what I'm looking for? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can speak to the homeless in that, Yes, we do know the regulars, and so does uh, Department of uh, Homeless Services know them. Mm -hmm. Because when you call them up and you give the description, they know who they are. Okay. okay. Uh, we know which ones are the aggressive ones. Okay. And when a stranger comes and we do see them, you know, 
most of them comply. So when uh, we ask them to sit up on the park bench, they'll sit up. Those that don't, that get angry, you know, uh, we then are aware of them. You know, uh, the thing to realize is that a lot of people think, okay, just call in 911 or yeah, 311 no. is going to solve the issue. It really doesn't. The police department itself, because I was on the uh, virtual meeting with the first precinct, the police department has, no longer has a homeless yeah. services unit. Okay, that that's gone. That doesn't exist. The way it's set up now is that actually Department of Homeless Services has to come out first. And if they deem that the person uh, needs to be removed because of uh, whatever condition or uh, if the person's seeking services or whatever, they're the ones that have to make the determination and they're the ones if they say, oh, okay, this person is, uh, in, you know, going to cause harm to themselves or somebody else, they're the ones that make that determination and then the police are called, which, uh, you know, really is a setback, really, to uh, anybody in security. No, oh, I, oh, interesting. Okay. And this is a setback, why? Because the Department of Homeless Services, you can turn around and report something to 311, okay? And how long does it take them to come and actually see that individual? By the time they get there, that individual is already on their way, moved, okay? Mm-hmm. Because it know. takes them hours, I assume, or? Right. I mean, it's, it's not like calling uh, the police who will show up at the max. I mean, the max, the response time that we have with the police, the max is 20 minutes. I mean, normally our response time with the first precinct is around 10 minutes, you know? So, okay. You're, you're talking about DHS showing up maybe a day later. You know, which is crazy. Well, I guess, which is fine for the people who are the regulars, but someone who's coming and going, it's not going to help. But I guess right. what I'm I'm raising it for is because I'm trying to figure out ways to interact and help them and help them get housed. One thing DHS told us in the Quality of Life Committee was that um, it takes a lot of touches of from them to meet the people, to make them feel comfortable and feel safe to actually apply for housing. Um, because once they go, you know, the the, the broad shelters are probably pretty horrible places and um, I'm going to sneeze. I'm just wondering how we as community. Well, your voice dropped out just to let you know. Justine, can you hear me? Your voice dropped out. Okay, but just just to touch base, like there's a there's a younger person that's over on South End Avenue. Yeah. Okay, that sleeps in a sleeping bag. Okay, we all know we all know him. He's been called. You know, Department of Homeless Services was called on him. Nine one one was called on him uh, by the community and that stuff. And you know, it's if he doesn't want to go, he doesn't go. You know what I'm oh. saying, and he, and he's co he's cooperative, and actually, you know, I won't identify the stores, but there's one or two stores where he goes in and he cleans up the store or does odd jobs for him. Sometimes does deliveries for him and that stuff. Just I don't know if he's doing it for food or for money, but obviously, he's existing. Okay, and to say that, let me let me throw this out to you. When was the last time anybody saw a Department of Homeless Services vehicle in Battery Park City? Never, but that's me. Okay, but it's the same thing on me. We used to see them every once in a while, driving around. Now we don't see them at all. That's that's being honest. Okay. Yeah, I mean that that would be my. But I also am not always out. But yeah, that would be my uh, reality. Is never. I see. Um, Bob Snack raised his hand for a long time, then Sarah Cassell, and then Cora, Ch Cora from Margaret Chin's office is in the chat. I will go to Bob, then Sarah, then Cora, okay? Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, I, I'm, 
Am I on? <clears throat> You're on, Bob. So my simple question uh, is, <clears throat> I've no often things are happening in in Battery Park City. For example, we had this major repaving out here <clears throat> uh, on uh, <clears throat> on West Thames and south of here. And during those things came up all of a sudden. I didn't know that they were going to come up. Uh, then there was there was a time when um, many of the entryways to Wagner Park were kind of blocked off. And when these things happen, I would ask the ambassadors, well, what's going on? You know, what is it? Do you know? And so my suggestion is it would be good for the ambassadors to be briefed on <coughs> various happenings. Uh, in the area, so they can actually tell us, oh, that's because Governor Cuomo is coming, or that's because we're going to have a that this road is closed because we're repaving it. It, it. it turned out that no one that I spoke to was an ambassador in any case when there was something going on in the community actually had any perspective on it or had been briefed about what it was. What it had to do with the community, how long it would last, how big it was. So that's just a suggestion. Okay, so Patrick. Okay, I appreciate I appreciate the suggestion. Thanks. Uh, my other question, hey, Bob, I, Bob. I'll jump in there for a second. This isn't explored known. How are you? Um, sorry. <laughs> um, the thing about the, the the incident with the paving, understood absolutely. That's run by the Department of Transportation. We didn't necessarily have a heads up there either. Um, but I think it came in like on a Saturday, Justine or someone had emailed me and we were able to pull up in short order from the DOT's website that they had their paving and milling schedule. So um, we can take that back as well and continue to ask city agencies and make sure they're giving a heads up about this stuff. But that wasn't something that we had planned or that we were doing. Um, so that wasn't you, Nick, right? That was that was. That, we, yeah, we, we we don't pave streets. We wouldn't we wouldn't pave the streets. That would be a city DOT matter. Uh, but all the same, uh, we can always do better with uh, doing our, our trying to get the communication and uh, updates out there. So uh, thanks for the note. And just just for the record, it was pretty horrifying nighttime noise for the people living on that side of the building, at least in 200 Rector. But um. <laughs> <laughs> and, and another question is, why are they doing this when the authority is planning to redo everything on the streets? You know, I know at some point it's going to get done, but, you know, West Thames Street is on the list of changes, even if we're complaining about it. But it's it's kind of crazy and a waste of money, isn't it, to do the milling now? Oh, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to comment. Does this, it's probably on a, a annual or semi-annual or, I don't know, biannual basis. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but... Um... No, I don't know. I, I don't think it's, I don't think we're close enough to get into the part to the start of the, the South End Avenue remodeling that would uh, one prevent them from paving the road, especially in the aware after. Yeah. Right, Nick? They should be aware of that it's going to happen. Oh, I mean, sure. I, sure, sure, sure. So, yeah, because sure. ever, I mean, that they're, they're, they're uh, very worried about their taxes and spending money, and I can think of a lot of better ways to spend it. But anyway, that's all done. Sarah, unless Bob, if you're, not, if you're done, then Sarah goes. I just have a just an extra question because Patrick has so much experience with handling um, behavioral problems. I often pass homeless people, and every once in a while, some of them are threatening and dangerous. This hasn't happened as much in Battery, the Battery Park City segments, but as I go farther north into Hudson River Park, every once in a while, there'll be someone who's actually a little bit on the aggressive side or all the time there are people asking for money and all the time there are people to feel sorry for it. And I really don't have uh, enough social behaviors to know what to do with them. I'd really like to do something helpful. And I've never found that doing a 311 or trying to get involved with someone uh, from homeless services ever did any good. So the question to Patrick and his wide experience with handling these guys is what is the right kind of behavior? Or if you're around children, what should you tell children about them? Or should children be afraid of them? Or how, you know, there's a whole social world of interaction that I'd really like some education in. 
Well, well, Bob, I mean, I ride the trains and uh, the trains are full of them. So as somebody, I see somebody starting to approach me, I just raise my hand up like a stop sign and they know they just stay away. Okay. Uh, you can't help everybody as an individual. I'm going I'm to say that. So, uh, you know, I know I have my charities. I'm sure you have your charities that you donate to and that's what I do. I mean, uh, there's actually people in my community work in soup kitchens. They volunteer at soup kitchen kitchens and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it's what we're seeing actually, even within Battery Park City, we know, we know the ones that, uh, you know, are not violent, at least when we approach them. But what we do have seen is that they're more aggressive right now. And that's, and that's pretty much, you know, all over, all over the city that you see. Uh, I mean, Penn Station is full of them, to be honest. And, you know, like that, they walk up to everybody. And I find my, my best thing is as you see them approaching, because, you know, you know who's going to walk up to you. you. Just put up your hand like a stop sign. And you know what? They just walk away. I, you know, that, that what is what works for me. I hope that helps you somewhat. Well, thank you. You know, thank you, Patrick. You're welcome. Sarah, thank you, Bob. Sarah, you're up. Okay. Um, I'm wondering, since the Radisson is going to become a shelter, why can't the people that you already know about, we already know about, are homeless, are in our community, are participating in our community, why can't we get them priority housing at the Radisson? Is that something we can work on? Is that something that, um, you know, obviously we've, we've, we've got Patrick and we've got Nick and um, I think that they probably know exactly who everybody is and, you know, and, and, and quite a few of us have actually chatted with this lovely young man who sleeps in the sleeping bag and yeah. Um, however, um, he should be a priority for the Radisson and he can still keep his, you know, little job. His day job. Hang so, on. We, yes. You know, it's, it seems doable. I don't know how to contribute to that, but it seems like we as a group could help with that. Well, you, did you attend that uh, CB1 emergency meeting dealing with the Radisson? Uh, because... I only got to see part of it. Okay, because there was a Department of Homeless Services individual wanted speaking about it and what they were doing with moving residents from the Upper West Side down to there. Really, it's, you know, we would love to uh, say, okay, here, here you go. But it's really their job. They, they have to go and do it. I mean, I'm on the security level. When you, know, you say dealing with they the have park. to go and do it, you mean the homeless people have to go and do it? No, the yes, DHS. They, no, no. DHS. Department DHS. of Homeless Services, homeless has, services. To, has to come out, and they're the ones that have to, you know, set this up for them. They're the ones that have to meet these individuals and set it up in person. Okay, do okay. we have a local um, Department of Homeless Services a group or team or person? Not that I'm aware of. Not that yeah. I'm aware of. Hi, Sarah. This is Lucian. Uh, so I, I can address a couple of the questions and comments that have come up so far regarding homelessness in, in CB1. Uh, the answer to the question is yes, the Quality of Life Committee is um, thinking through ways to create opportunities for homeless individuals who do reside in our district. Um, it is something that's been identified and it's, it's a priority. It's been made clear to the Department of Homeless Services. Um, and it's possible that uh, some amount of capacity could be opened up, not in the Radisson, but in a different hotel um, for people who uh, accept shelter services in our district. 
um, it's something that we're, you know, we're tracking and we'd love to see how that develops. Um, but it, it certainly is something that uh, the, the board is working on. Um, and also, in terms of um, the, the effectiveness of calling 311, the, you know, the pipeline to getting services and getting off the street um, is it's made possible by allowing those who provide the services and the outreach to know where people are. Um, almost some homeless people stay in one spot and they're easy to find and some people move. Um, and the more often than not, homeless people are known to the Department of Homeless Services um, uh, and they're rediscovered when they do move and they emerge in a different spot in the city. So when you call 311, um, it may not have an immediate effect. Of course, we would always love to, for it to have an immediate impact and the, the van to arrive and people to get out and the person to go in the van and get some warmth and some food and place to sleep. But um, it does allow the city to know where people are and when people, and outreach is available. They send them, they they offer services, and people eventually, you know, in a, in a, in a hopeful way, uh, they do take them. And... Um, you know, the fact that the, there's a shelter expansion um, is, is a testament to that, I, I believe. So I would say that don't, in, don't, the, in lower Manhattan, where in Battery Park City, is, are they considering a shelter? No, not in Battery Park City. Um, but but and, and I, 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 I have nothing. I don't know. They've come to CB1 and they asked us to help them find a place for permanent shelter. But certainly they're doing that supposedly all across the city because there's a need for more capacity because it's a right to shelter city. So anyone who, who wishes to have shelter has the right to get that shelter in our city. So um, the city's closed down um, types of, of shelter that were substandard cluster sites and in, in, in previous to COVID-19, they were shutting down hotels because hotels are, are, are not as good as um, some of the other shelters, but given social distancing needs, They've gone back to that, but back to my original point is that um, I would encourage everyone to keep calling three one one when they identify someone who's in need and allow the city to engage to to find out where people are. Sometimes they're you know they're finding people that they had a, a, a good conversation going, and then this is a way for them to pick up because they were probably in East Harlem before, or in the Bronx, or in Queens, and they've traveled. Um, Lucian, what I'm hearing is there is no um, department. Um, team for areas correct so so in lower manhattan uh the the outreach team the city uses is uh goddard down uh lower manhattan goddard is a not-for-profit organization that does that's contracted to do homeless outreach it's it's, it's a non-profit so it's not a um but contracted for the city oh contracted okay yeah. so the city agency, you know so the city doesn't you know for a lot of agencies don't hire up you know every person they'll they'll have a big contract and then they'll allow the not for profit to do it it makes procurement easier and staffing easier um, so but Goddard is the organization that does the outreach for DHS but there certainly are DHS teams that go out as well it's a, it's a mix so you but we do have a contact from Manhattan that's Leilani Irvin Justine you've met her a million times yes um, I have and yeah, and. Yeah. No, go ahead, because I think that, that's, that she was she was trying to take some accountability, but I think there's a difference between Lilani, who's who's there and paying attention, and the outreach directly. But a couple of things. I want to say that, Sarah, great points that you're raising. Um, Tammy has actually brought this up in her broad, big, big meeting, asking to have, and I think also the borough president has said, we want to take care of the people who are on the streets in our neighborhood right now to place them. And I think, Lucian, the dilemma and that I heard back from the whole, when we were on that call and Shams was on the call, who was a homeless man at the Lucerne, he said that when the people would come, one of the dilemmas of um, people who are on the street is that, yes, uh, DHS wants them to come into their system, be interviewed, go through this whole process, but you don't know where you're going to go. It's not like you can say, okay, I'd like to stay in this neighborhood. I mean, I suppose one school of thought might be uh, you're homeless, take anything you get, but it's dehumanizing to have that. And I, I think we could do better than that. But anyhow, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Um, Sarah, are you done? I agree. And um, the fact that Satan has a job down here that he does and, and a network 
he should be allowed to stay in the area. If the Radisson opens, he should have priority. I, I agree. It's not our call. It's not, it's not um, Pat's call, Patrick's call either, but it's, it's not our call. But I agree with you. All right. Um, I know I said Cora was next, so can we unmute Cora, please? And that's the illusion who has to unmute her. She's in the chat. Click on mute, but it's um... Cora. Are they, maybe she's there. there yes, go. got it. Thank you for your patience, Cora. So, can I unvideo myself too? No, it's not that I want to hide, but it no, I don't think you. I I don't think I have the option to turn on the video either. So, no, but Cora, anyway, now. you know my voice. <laughs> it's me, Cora here. Uh, I want to make a response to what Justin talked about earlier. It does take a long time for homeless caseworker to build trust with the homeless person. And according to the DHS team, it takes about an average of 267 interaction with the individual for them to accept the caseworker to work with them. I remember the number 267 when I first heard of, when I first heard of it, that they have to have two hundred and sixty-seven calls. Yes. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of what you said. No calls. The they actually the homeless outreach team. I have a lot of admiration for them. They actually know the people, like Patrick said. They actually go out there when we're sleeping in the middle of the night. They were out there. They were out there. So the reason I remember the number is, it's not sixty-seven. It's not twenty-six. Is 267 and it makes sense because I don't know you. It took me a long time to know Justin and everybody. And it took me like 2 years. Keep coming back and attending the meeting and I thought people would remember me, but no, I, I thought so. So, and they don't see them all the time. So why would they trust you? So this is the experience that the homeless outreach team share with us. Right? Then as to Patrick's comments. I also attend. The first precinct community council monthly meeting regularly. And yes, the NYPD homeless outreach team was eliminated soon after the budget, after June, right? But the way I understand it is that according to the commanding officer, Captain Figueroa, and the community affairs unit, Brian Nelson, whom you met at the last quality of life meeting. If someone call 911 or 311, it's not that like the PD, they're not looking after them. They will still handle the situation. They will still take the call because if the call goes to the first precinct, the police officers will still handle the situation until the DHS homeless outreach team arrives, right? So you ask the question, how can the community board help? Uh, what I observed over time is that residents often get to better understand the work and the role of the PD after they attended a community council meeting. Why? Because the officers and the commanding officer actually explain very well what their role is, what their work is, why they can or cannot do certain things. And a lot of times when I manage to get the residents like, please come, and now with Zoom meeting, it's, it's much easier that they raise their concerns and they question, they bang the officer like, why, blah, 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 blah. Like, they really angry and get upset. But that's the beginning of the dialogue. And I find that very, very helpful because then they get a chance to hear directly from the officers and that gets a better understanding. So I would imagine if your committee or the uh, community board can actually embrace this more and how to help spread the message, how every time you you have a meeting and you remind people, hey, this is a you know, community council meeting or this is another meeting, another meeting. So at least people can talk, not one way. It has to be two ways. Like when we had that uh, Radisson Hotel conversation, because everything is screened, you can't really hear from the people, their voice. And then the outside can really see those messages uh, versus the meeting. The first round, it was really nasty. The people are very upset when they have the Upper West Side meeting. But you get a sense of like where people are 
And two way communications is the best way. So, if there's any way you can host more conversation, more dialogue, like Brian Nelson, the officer, now she, he's in charge of the community affairs together with Tommy Moran. So, I think it, it's a very good start and to keep, keep encouraging the residents in the CB1 area to come because people are really angry with the homeless, but there are lots of stories, aspects, and perspectives they don't get to see. And I would like to see more of that if we can yeah. do it together. Thank you, Cora. Totally. Um, I, I'm not angry with the homeless. I, I want to help them. But yes, there are people who are angry and you're correct. Um, unfortunately, quality of life is the place where that conversation goes. But I, we have asked and multiple people have asked to have a separate. Um, uh, I forget. It may not. It doesn't. Oh, a separate. Um, uh, task force or subcommittee or something underneath quality of life so we can focus on these issues because they're so important they should be discussed once a month they should be out there people should be able to have access to the answers to their questions and uh, it's, it's, it's just very very concerning all the way around so i i think that that makes sense and yeah. it's not the place for it here but just one thing saying makes sense the reason I said the angry, angry people, but I noticed that every time after they attended the community council meeting, because mm -hmm. they got that direct dialogue and they actually hear from the officers what the challenges are, they are less angry and okay. less upset. And there's always one or two that said, wow, thank you so much. Yep. They thank the officer. Well, yeah, no, th definitely the officers deserve to be thanked for their for their service because they're doing something for us and they're putting themselves in the line. But there's also a balance that has to be struck. But anyhow, um, I also I see that Betty thank Kane you. has raised her hand. No, thank you, Cora. And also um, in the chat, Cora had some ideas for the senior group, which maybe um, you could either share directly with um, Marianne or uh, maybe Lucian can share it with Marianne so she has that. Um, I see Betty can you raise your hand, Sarah, I'm thinking you're not still raising your hand, but I also see in the attendees and Betty, if I can ask Amy in the attendees to go first or, or I guess I can't, I got to do, I've got to do the board first. So Betty, you're first and then Amy. Go ahead. Betty. I want to thank Cora for speaking because it's kind of an entree into what I want to say as someone who has one been on the quality of life committee for a number of years. That's where I started but also worked in the healthcare field for my whole career. I want to point out a whole nother perspective that everybody who really wants to go help, I want to think of help from a different perspective. It is very condescending when people come to you and tell you what help you need. I get it because of disability and people telling me what I should do to make my life better. Same thing with the homeless. If they wanted to get off the street and were ready to accept assistance, I wouldn't assume the social workers are all incompetent or that the, the uh, police are all incompetent. It's maybe the person just isn't ready for whatever reason. There are lots of them when they say it takes up to 200 visits before they decide to do something. There are groups who are trying to reunite homeless with family members, feeling that's the key ingredient is they're missing that link. They also acknowledge it is a small percent over many visits that are success stories for them. So they're all missing pieces. But one thing I always taught my students, don't make somebody else's problems yours. They're not yours. You have no right to think that you have a decision-making capacity. You have no right to be that condescending. Back off. And I wish people would consider that because a lot of your help is nothing when it's offered, it may be offered with very good intentions. It's heard very differently. That a help, it's more you're telling me what to do because what I'm doing must be wrong. And I'm sure that's not what you mean, but consider that perspective too. That's all. Thank you for sharing, Betty. I appreciate that. Um, Amy in the chat and then Taylor Banning in the chat. And Lucian, you got to unmute Amy first and then Taylor. There you go, Amy, you're up. Thank you. Um, and I feel terrible because I, this is a very passionate and important conversation. And, but I just want to circle back to Patrick Murphy and the allied ambassadors um, because I have 
nothing but compassion for the homeless, but there's in terms of the neighborhood and, and the ambassador's role, my question is homeless people are homeless. People with mentally mental health issues are a different story. So my question is, because I have witnessed some unfortunate incidents in the neighborhood, um, I, I just would like to know about the training or what support the allied ambassadors have in order to help them cope with when they run into a situation so that they are helping the, the residents when there are, and there have been several occasions and there are gonna continue to be people who are mental health issues, it's different, passing through or just within the neighborhood. Um, and I just w wondered what, what training they have because, and I forgive my ignorance, Patrick, I just don't know what the ambassadors have to go through in order to perform their jobs. And I'm concerned for them as well. Hello. Uh, well, you know, they they go through uh, a constant training, actually with us, uh, it's a uh, desktop training. And uh, it's done through a program, which we call eHub. And there's so many courses that'll pop up during the course of a month that they'll sit down at the, at the computer and go, and go through. Basically, um, you know, a lot of the stuff tends to be common sense, at least from what I see. When they, when they go to approach a homeless person, they're not waking them up, they're not walking over, you know, like the old time cop with a nightstick tapping them on the foot, you know, saying you have to get up. You know, they're busy talking to them from a distance. This is what I have told them and trained them to do talk from a distance you know when you talk from a distance you can tell whether or not somebody's going to be responsive you know whether they're going to be respond to you in a positive way or a negative way okay if the person jumps up they know stepping back they also reach out in that case and call the supervisor the supervisor will show up with Another supervisor also responding and another safety ambassador responding from another area and talk to the individual from a distance. Okay, we're talking about a park that's open to everybody, doesn't close to one o'clock in the morning. We're just asking them to sit up in the bench instead of sleeping on the bench. Okay, most of them then we back off. When you back off, you know, and they see that, you know, they, they think they won, whatever, you know, they get up and they relocate. They'll move on. I would say about 95% of them get up and they leave the park. Okay, there's an, uh, another few that will leave, let's say, if they're down at Wagner Park, they'll walk up to, Rose, uh, to Rockefeller Park, and they'll go lay down on the bench there. And then the same thing happens up there. But uh, as far as training, there's always constant training going and dealing with them on the bicycles. Uh, we do that training every year, even though they've been trained, let's say, the year before. We go through it again. OK, uh, obviously, uh, I have instilled in the safety ambassadors, you know, we have a do not touch policy. OK, so, uh, you know, unless you're uh, an SPO, that has peace officer status, okay, you're not touching anybody, all right? So, so thankfully, so far, uh, that method has worked, you know, and we've been successful with it. You know, obviously, we, you know, everybody I think now in the community is aware of the homeless person that walks through uh, Battery Park screaming at the top of his lungs, right? He has a regular path that he walks. He walks that path almost every day. Okay, it's in the park. He goes through the park, a certain area, and then he exits the park. Okay, as long as you leave him alone, nobody really, you know, if you know him, you just leave him alone. He walks by, keeps on going, and every once in a while, he'll jump out and start screaming for no reason and keeps on going. I mean, you know, it, uh, comes down to a while after a while as you know I can't help the cop jargon because I was one you know it's knowing everybody on your post 
That's what it comes down to. When you when you know your post, you know the people that go there, and you know those that, you know, act certain ways. I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, it does. Um, I, I will just tell you from personal experience. That's why I was asking. Um, I had to help an ambassador once with my son um, because she was very distraught because a mentally unstable person, I, I gather, I don't know, was apparently bothering her. I didn't see the beginning or the end, but I know that I intervened um, to tell her where she was because she couldn't tell her she was trying to call for help, but she couldn't figure out the street name. And at, I was totally fine. I was not threatened by the individual that was she felt threatened by, but I did worry about her safety because it's not her neighborhood, so she doesn't know where she is. Um, and while, you know, ideally, I would like to think she can protect my children when they're out on the street or myself, at the moment, I'm looking at a, a young woman who was clearly distraught and um, didn't have the, you know, the, com more, the compass internally to know exactly where she was to call for help. So that's what my question was based on mostly, just for their own safety, what do they go through? Um, you know, because any of us can walk down the street and have somebody uh, approach me and I will feel intimidated as a woman on the subway or whatever. Um, I don't have the right answers. I do my best, but in a professional capacity, I would just hope that they are comfortable and protected for themselves. And I'm sure, it was, one -off, I'm sure it was a one-off incident, Patrick, so I'm not, I'm not making an incident. I'm just saying um, it was disconcerting for me to see this young woman. I understand. I believe that was like uh, what over almost two years ago now. If, no. Uh, <laughs> no. 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 Okay. okay. Uh, Regardless if it was two years ago or six months ago, is it's again, right. I, you know, your ambassadors are walking the streets for our neighborhood and for our residents, um, and they have certain risks as well. And I respect that. Contrary to what you may believe, I do respect that. And. I think it's, I don't go out late at night anymore as I used to for a nightly walk because I don't feel safe. Your ambassadors are out there and I would just, that was my question. Are, what do they go through and what are they equipped with for their own safety as well as the rest of us? That's it. Okay. Thank you for but that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, Patrick, she raises a point that's interesting and um, maybe is something for you to think about. Because it would be good for the people to know who they are, and uh, you know that's kind of scary. And being worried about the people is kind of scary. Like I said, Taylor Banning has her, has her hands up next, but I'm not sure if she took it down. Hi, good evening. This is Taylor Banning. I took it down. Um, I, I guess I was going to share something, just personal, but um, that I I think I guess I'll share it. Yeah, go ahead. I. Um, I was houseless, um, and it took support from community, family, and elected officials, and financial aid from the government to survive to survive that period of time. So, um, just just saying that you know, I think it's a similar effort required to make sure all New Yorkers have a home, a community. Um, Medical professionals and elected officials uh, together with empathy and compassion. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Taylor. I appreciate it. Um, any more questions? I don't think so. Sorry, um, I don't see any other questions. So then perhaps we are done. Patrick, thank you. I am sorry that you were on the spot for a half hour or longer, but um, I found this to be much more robust conversation about what's going on in our neighborhood. And I would love to do this. And I would love to make, you know, do you the favor also of having you go earlier in the night. So you don't have to, I'd love you to say all the meetings, but so you don't have to always wait till the end. And well, well, thank you for that. And I, I just like to add one, one more thing. Don't forget about the NCOs. Okay. Cause you know, each, each area in Battery Park city, you have two NCOs assigned. Okay, I know with everything going on uh, right now, they may not be 
uh, around this week because of uh, the elections and what they've been assigned. But they do cover the neighborhood. They do call people back. They do call me back when I send them something. So please keep that in mind. No, I appreciate that, Patrick. Thank you. And and we are really glad for the NCOs that are here. And we appreciate what, what Ally does. I, I I think we are lucky to have them. Thank you. No, I'm serious. I am. I think that it's it's uh, yeah, yeah, it's probably not to be said on this call, but um, I feel I feel safer with you all there than not because, uh, yeah, I think that um, I'm thankful for you. How's that? I'll leave it at that and keep my politics out of it. Hey, um, just, Justine, it's Nick Swardone. Thank you for that, by the way, and thanks, Pat. You know, it, it occurs to me now as we're sitting here this evening. It's just about five years or so ago now that we first began the engagement with Ally. I believe it was toward the end of 2015. Um, and it's really been a good, it's, a, it's been a really good and productive partnership. And a lot of that, a lot of that is, uh, is credit to Pat for being here and with the community and here every month in and out with me, uh, building that trust and making sure that the community knows that we're here working. Thank you for that. Uh, one thing that came up also and certainly agreed that we can maybe try to um, get some more, add more context to when Pat's giving his reports about goings on in the neighborhood, which the conversations usually evolve into anyway. Um, things like emergency or seemingly kind of exigent circumstances, like the the window cleaners that got kind of pinned to the side of the building a few weeks ago. Absolutely, things like that. I think we spoke about that, but those are also those are also things that in real time you're likely getting an email from me. Like I think I probably sent something out to you that morning after conversing with Pat saying, hey, heads up as the CB1 chair, you and Tammy, this is happening. Um, so those are things that certainly when it's at that level of uh, potential emergency, you're going to be hearing from us in real time. We're not going to just hold out until the, until the meeting. Um, but then also at the meeting, certainly we'll always recap yes. and let you know what we learned in the interim. Uh, thank you, Nick. No, I appreciate that. Because yes, I appreciate the real time information, but I also think it's important for the um, the committee to hear what's going on in the neighborhood and, and the people who call in. So, when, and eventually when we all have meetings in one place, they all show up. So, thank you. Um, Nick, I'm Absolutely. pushing you after, I'm pushing you next after uh, the Gateway Plaza talk, please. It's okay. And, it's okay. I'm here. I'm here for the duration. You know that. Oh, thank you. I know. You're very kind. So, okay, Jeff Galloway, you are up, sir. Okay. And thank you again. Um, thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, I'm going to report on two things. The, the agenda is a little bit um, uh, misleading. There, there, there are actually uh, two developments at Gateway that I'll be reporting on. One is the rent stabilization agreement, and the other is the class action settlement. Those are uh, distinct issues, uh, but they <clears throat> both have recent developments. Um, as many of you know, because I know some of you are, in fact, Gateway residents, uh, we now have an extension of uh, what we call the quasi rent stabilization agreement at gateway QRS agreement. And let me just give a little bit of background uh, so you can understand the context of, of the new agreement. Um, gateway was originally built with Mitchell Lama uh, uh, financing. It's the only thing in Battery Park City that's part of the original master plan, which called for affordable housing, among other things in Battery Park City. And though, although Gateway was built with subsidized um, funding, uh, when it originally opened, it opened as a market rate uh, complex. And that was back in 1982. Um, the Tenants Association um, uh, was formed almost immediately after the building uh, opened or the complex opened um, and uh, argued that because of the uh, uh, Mitchell Lama funding and so forth, the complex should be rent regulated. Uh, the association sued uh, various people, including the authority as well as the, uh, the landlord, in order to uh, seek to have the complex stabilized. That lawsuit was settled in the mid 80s. And as a result of the settlement of that lawsuit, the first QRS agreement was entered into. That was part of the settlement of the lawsuit. Uh, the original agreement uh, had a 10 year term. It provided that uh, all tenants at Gateway, all residents of Gateway, uh, were entitled to renewal leases of one, two, or three years, 
and that the uh, rental increases would be governed by what was uh, whatever the then current rent stabilization guidelines were. Um, it was not technically rent stabilized. It was a private agreement. Uh, the agreement, so it, the first agreement was 10 years. It was repeatedly extended uh, over the course of history um, as a result of negotiations um, by the authority uh, acting for the tenants as well as for itself um, and the landlord, the left rack organization. Generally speaking, the, the agreement was extended in exchange for benefits that the landlord sought from the authority or from the state. Um, uh, those were the days when, when Sheldon Silver was our assembly person and speaker of the assembly and certain things that uh, the landlord desired had to be signed off on by the speaker. Uh, and so we were successful in getting the agreement extended repeatedly until uh, 2009. Um, in 2009, it was extended again, uh, but for the first time through these similar negotiations, um, uh, but for the first time, uh, the protections were limited uh, to the people, the residents who were then current residents, as opposed to all present and future uh, residents. So the 2009 agreement covered everybody that was in Gateway as of June of 2009, uh, and it had an expiration date of this past June uh, 2020. Um, in July of, uh, of this year of 2020, um, a new agreement was reached between the authority and LEFRAC, uh, retroactive to July 1st. Uh, and that agreement was, uh, was long in coming. A, 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 a huge number of people uh, expended a uh, tremendous amount of effort to, to bring that agreement to fruition. Uh, not only uh, any number of the people uh, at the authority, uh, including BJ Jones, uh, Eric Munson, uh, and, and, and Nick as, as well, uh, as well as all of our elected officials, um, uh, Borough President Gail Brewer, Congressman Nadler, Controller Stringer, uh, Senator Kavanaugh, Assemblymember Yuling New, and Councilmember Margaret Chen were, were, were all involved, um, as was the community board. Uh, a year ago, the community board uh, passed a re resolution in support of uh, concluding these negotiations in a manner that would extend the protections. So the agreement, um, uh, as I said, was entered into in July of this past year. It's not a perfect agreement, but it was a result of long negotiations uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and certainly uh, the authority believes, and we have no reason to, uh, to, to disagree, that it was the best agreement that could be achieved uh, to protect the tenants. Um, its basic terms are it continues to protect the same set of tenants that were protected before, those people that were in residence as of 2009, uh, instead of the uh, rent stabilization guidelines as the metric for uh, rent increases, it's a fixed percentage of 2.5% um, for one-year leases and 3.78% for two-year leases, uh, which if you do the math, the, the two are equivalent uh, to, to one another uh, uh, economically, at least for the first two years. Um, uh, it, um, it was retroactive to July 1st, uh, so that it would cover um, uh, everyone. Uh, and, uh, but it was contingent on uh, HUD uh, approving the agreement. Uh, and that's because HUD ensures the mortgage uh, for uh, Gateway. And under the terms of that mortgage, it has the right to approve certain things, which, and the agreement falls under that. Um, uh, we were um, notified by both, uh, probably Nick, uh, but certainly the authority, as well as Congressman Nadler, um, uh, about a week and a half ago, that HUD has now uh, approved the agreement. Um, and the Tenants Association has um, uh, inquiries outstanding to, uh, to the LEFRAC organization of how they will effectuate um, the, um, uh, the retroactivity uh, protections. Um, uh, the agreement extends uh, for another 10 years, the protections, until June 30th, um, uh, 2030, uh, because of a non-disclosure agreement between the authority and LEFRAC during the course of the negotiations, 
We're not currently privy to the full terms. Uh, either of the agreement itself, for that matter, as well as uh, the the um, uh, benefits or accommodations that were made uh, to the landlord. But those are presumably all pu public documents, which will be available for uh, anyone who cares to see them, including all of us uh, in the not too distant future. Um, uh, we can see from uh, public filings uh, that, among other things, the landlord ha uh, secured a, an additional five years on its ground lease running to 2045 with the ability to have uh, extensions to 2069. It previously had the ability to have those extensions to 2069, but the now current uh, ground lease instead of uh, expired in 2040 will expire in uh, 2045. And that's pretty much the extent of the publicly available knowledge uh, right now in terms of what's on file with the city registers uh, office. Um, and um, uh, let's see, what else? Um, I just want to say that, um, uh, you know, it, it, it was, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, uh, you know, kind of a long haul to get to where we are. Um, there were a lot of things that we wanted to achieve that we were not able to achieve, but we did, we were able to achieve continued protection of the tenants that were currently uh, protected. Uh, and uh, we think that's something that will be beneficial to the community. Because these people, by their very nature, have been longtime residents of the community. They, they have to have lived here since 2009, and many of them have lived here much longer than that. And they, they form um, a, an important uh, part of the fabric, fabric of the community. Um, I'll go on to the class action in a minute, but why don't I just pause for comments, uh, questions on the QRS agreement? That's a good idea. Um Lucian, if you're there, Robin is in the chat, but uh, the attendee list. Could you move her over, please? Um, and then, thank you. Anybody have any questions? I think Robin had, she was texting me on the side. Um, Robin may have something to say, but I mean, with you. But you're fading out, Justine. Can't hear you. Still can't hear you. I, I was just going to add on to uh, what Jeff said. Thanks, Jeff, for, sure. for doing that for sure. us. Um, Jeff did the uh, QRS agreement, and as Nick knows and others know, we're very anxious to see uh, the sign, uh, which we have not been privy to, and it's uh, a little bit ridiculous that we haven't, and we're hoping that uh, the authority or somebody in the lower frack organization will provide that to us. It will be the basis for leases and and other provisions for the next 10 years. Um, as of July 1st of this year, so that's that's all I wanted to say. Thanks Robin and sorry, my, my uh, sound keeps going in and out. And it's maybe doing it seems like I've got it now for the moment. Um, Jeff, I guess and maybe Robin, anybody else. So you all, we were aware that they signed HUD signed the deal. So that's good. You haven't seen it yet. Um, questions I have is what's happened in the interim. So a lot of people had signed leases after June of is that when it was the the deal ended? The yeah, it's I I can try to describe that. It's it's it's. Um, uh, I know I'm kind of echoing here. Hopefully I'm, I don't sound echoes to everybody else. Um, it's kind of a confusing situation. Um, tenants who, uh, not surprisingly, uh, every month there is a, a set of tenants whose leases expire since people have moved in pretty much year different times of the year. Um, so people that were previously covered by the expiring agreement, if their leases um, expired um, after June 30th, so for example, their lease expired July 31st, they were offered renewals um, uh, uh, at non-QRS rates. Um, because of the class action that I'll talk about in a minute, those increases were limited to 5% um, for, uh, for a year and 7 point something or other percent for uh, two years. But, you know, there was twice the increases that were allowable under the QRS agreement. So people whose leases expired end of July, end of August, end of September, end of October, 
um, all had renewal offers uh, at those uh, rates. People whose leases uh, expired November 30th or December 31st were given renewal offers at the actual two and a half percent uh, rates. Um, I, I, I think the management people finally realized that it was more trouble than it was worth to retroactively change everybody's lease uh, after HUD approved it because there was never any real doubt that HUD would approve the agreement that uh, that they eventually started offering uh, leases that were conforming to the uh, terms of the QRS agreement. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a significant chunk of tenants out there uh, who have leases um, uh, who signed lease renewals at the wrong rates. Beginning, I don't know, maybe about a month ago, uh, management started sending out amendments to those leases to those tenants that had been um, given the 5% the, the, the increases. And these amendments knocked their rents back down to two and a half. As far as we know, we, we, we don't know how many people were sent those uh, renewal forms, nor do we know how uh, management has dealt with the rent that was overpaid, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, we've, th thanks to uh, the good work of, uh, of, of Margaret Chen and Gail Brewer, um, we now have a new sort of communication route uh, as a tenants association with the left rack organization uh, and we've had uh, a, you know a, a very constructive uh, zoom type meeting as well as some constructive email exchanges following that uh, and by constructive I don't necessarily mean that they're agreeing with everything sometimes it's just that they politely say no to things that we ask for um, but uh, but they but but they do at least respond to our inquiries in a in a, in, you know, in a reasonably timely manner. Uh, and so through that line of communication, we have asked for um, uh, an explanation of how this retroactivity will be implemented for those people who signed and paid uh, increase amounts. We don't have a response yet, um, but we, we hope to get one. I, I don't know, Robin, you wanna add anything to that? You're on mute. I would add is once we know, we'll circulate that information uh, to the tenants because people were paying for the three or four months, the 5% increase rather than the two and a half percent, which is the, the increase amount in the QRS agreement. So they're owed money for, you know, the amounts that they paid. And we're hopeful that LaFrac will actually refund that money in some way to those people because in this economy there, we have a lot of people who are, you know, in a difficult situation. So, um, yeah, we're hopeful, uh, but we're waiting for a reply from the LaFrac people. Other questions, comments? I can go on to the class action. Um, okay. The uh, Justine, were you trying to say something through your non-audio? <laughs> yeah, my non-audio. So you may speak. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there you go. It's back again. I guess I might let me ask a quick question before now that mm -hmm. I have the audio back, which was what happens to the people who are not part of the QRS group? What what are their increases? Just anything? Um, just anything. Although um, uh, I mean, there are blessings in lots of different disguises, uh, but. Um, as a result of COVID, the market yeah. rents, in fact, are not going up. Um, right. and, and some people have been successful and actually at the market people, some of them have been successful in even getting reductions at, at, at renewal. Oh, um, that's nice. Um, but, uh, but, but many um, are, are seeing, uh, are reporting to us that they're getting no increase. Um, no increase, so no same increase. Or, or some reduction. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, talk about the class action. That makes sense, thank you. Okay, so the class action is um, um, uh, an entirely distinct uh, situation from the QRS agreement. They're not related to one another uh, at, at all. Uh, nor, are, nor is the class action really related uh, to the Tenants Association in any meaningful way. 
Um, and I guess I should have uh, noted, you know, although I am on this committee and a member of the community board, uh, I'm also the secretary of the Tenants Association and member of the board, Robin's VP uh, of Tenants Association, and um, and Sarah is is also a member of the board of the Tenants Association. Um, so the class action um, is is a lawsuit that was brought back in 2014. Um, uh, independently of the tenants association uh, by some tenants um, that that were not formally or even informally affiliated with uh, with the board. The subject matter of the lawsuit was basically the high electricity bills that tenants at Gateway um, pay, and, and they used to be even higher uh, because the walls are poorly insulated. Uh, the windows were, you know, 1982 vintage windows, also poorly insulated and very uh, leaky. Um, and the heat uh, in Gateway is electric. It's these uh, wall units that we all pay for uh, out of our electrical bill. And to add insult to injury, we pay that electricity to LeFrac. Uh, they sub uh, submeter the electricity, and 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 so we pay our electricity uh, to the same people that we pay our rent to. So the, the, the high electric bills, the poor insulation, the poor windows were, has been a subject of complaint for many, many years uh, at Gateway. And um, in late 2013 and early 2014, there were parallel efforts to deal with that situation. The Tenants Association was working uh, with uh, elected officials and with the community board. Um, uh, and, uh, and in particular, then Senator Squadron, as well as Council Member Chin, were very much involved in those discussions. Um, and uh, as a result of those discussions, uh, the landlord agreed to replace uh, all of the uh, what are known as PTAC units. I've forgotten what PTAC stands for, but it's the unit that's the air conditioner and the, um, and the heater. Replace them all with more energy efficient units and to replace all of the windows uh, at Gateway. Um, uh, and, and that was done, uh, although it took a while to get it done, but it was done over the succeeding years. Um, while those negotiations were going on, this lawsuit was filed, essentially asking for the same thing. Uh, but since by the time the lawsuit got anywhere, and it, it's sad commentary on the New York court system, this lawsuit had a long, torturous history. As I said, it started in 2014, and we're, we're now talking about the settlement here six years later in 2020. Um, by the time the lawsuit was really advancing very far, um, it really became a lawsuit over the overpaid electrical charges prior to these renovations at Gateway, as opposed to seeking um, you know, changes, because the changes were happening independently of the lawsuit. In any event, a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, in October of 2019, um, uh, LEFRAC and uh, the class plaintiffs reached a settlement uh, of the lawsuit because it is a class action. It required court approval as, where it, as well as various uh, notice requirements and the ability of class members to opt out and, and so forth. Um, the agreement was approved by the court in March uh, of, la of this year, 2020. Um, in order to obtain uh, benefits under the class action, uh, class members, which are basically anyone who has lived in Gateway since April of 2008. Um, uh, the, the, the magic to that date is that six years uh, before the start of the lawsuit and the statute of limitations, six years. Um, so uh, class members, tenants uh, needed to file a, a claim form by April of this last year. Um, the main uh, the, this, the main terms of the settlement, the, the term that affects anybody in their day-to-day -day life uh, is a $10 million uh, settlement fund that was set up, uh, of which um, uh, about $3.4 million uh, goes to the, to the lawyers, uh, uh, leaving uh, uh, about, maybe it's $3.6 million, I went down someplace. Um, no, 3.4 million going to the, the, the lawyers, leaving about 6.6 uh, to be distributed um, uh, to the tenants. The, uh, the form of that distribution, uh, former tenants will get a check, uh, current tenants will get a credit on their rent bill. The amount 
that you get uh, is a function of how long you lived at Gateway since 2008, as well as what your rent was during the time that you uh, lived there. Um, it's impossible to tell how much these dollars and cents will be um, ahead of time because it depends on how many people submitted claim forms because it's a $6.6 .6 million fund that's going to be distributed. Um, and, and so how that gets divvied up uh, depends obviously on how many people are asking for it. Um, however, the, the in, there is information in the claim in the settlement notice that gives you kind of a rough idea of, of what at least the class action lawyers think the amount will be per tenant. And for current tenants who are looking at rent credits, um, if you've lived in Gateway since 2008, uh, you can expect probably anywhere from one to two to maybe even three months rent credit, um, free rent. Um, uh, once again, that's, you know, it, it could be substantially different than that, including substantially less than that, depending upon uh, how many people um, submit claim forms. But, you know, it could, it could be a month uh, at least for, for many tenants. And so that in these COVID times, that's important. Um, when are those benefits going to be uh, distributed? Well, um, under the settlement agreement, uh, the settlement agreement becomes final when the time to appeal the court approval of the settlement expires. That's normally 30 days after the approval order under New York court rules. As I said, it was approved in March. So normally the time to appeal would have been expend, expired in April. COVID, however, conspired uh, to uh, create problems. Um, um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, closures in the courthouse meant that the judgment itself, which is what you appeal from, and it's based on the court order, didn't actually get entered until August rather than in March. Um, and then meanwhile, Governor Cuomo had issued various executive orders extending all deadlines in the court system pending COVID. The net result is that all of those uh, deadlines or the, the most recent executive order, the deadline extension expired today, uh, actually. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, so with any kind of luck, uh, people should start seeing their credits in the not too distant future. So that's one of the questions that we asked to the left rack people in this new line of communication that I mentioned before, and on the class action lawyers website, there is some similar information. The website says benefits should go out in December. Uh, what the left rack communications people told us is that the rent credits should show up on our January rent bill. We've asked for clarification. Is that the rent? Is that the bill for the January rent, or is that the bill that we receive in January for the February rent? And we we don't have that clarification uh, yet. Um, uh, but whatever it is, it couldn't come soon enough given these uh, COVID times. Yeah, um, that's, that's amazing. That's yeah. great. So so in any event, that's what that's what we expect. You know, sometime in in, in the uh, in, unless. There's another executive order out there further extending these deadlines. I mean, the, there, there's been a monthly executive order extending these deadlines, but the most recent one that was entered in o October, the language in the executive order suggested that this extension was the last one. Uh, and so, and I'm not aware of any further extension of ha uh, as having been uh, issued. And so that that's actually really cool. Now, what happens, so it goes back, so people who were living in Gateway up until as of 2008, January beginning, uh, beginning April of 2008, you know, six years before the start of the lawsuit uh, and, and how much they get. So if they're no longer at Gateway, they'll get a check. Right. Uh, and that check amount will be dependent on the Their amount rent. of rent they paid in the aggregate for however long they were at Gateway. And what outreach is being done to get people who've moved out already? Uh, well, that was the responsibility of the class action lawyers and um, they um, uh, presumably, 
got a list of the last contact information from the landlord and you know everybody was you know in, in multiple different ways sent notices of it i mean we i mean i know a number of ex gateway residents who did indeed get those notices you're on mute again justine I hear you. I think if you mute and unmute, it comes back. Now, yeah. oh, now you are. There you are. And now I am again. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say thank you so much. Kathy has her hand raised. So let's go to Kathy. Sure. Uh, first, thank you, Jeff, and the tenants for this phenomenal amount of work you've done. Um, the, um, I, I guess my question is, I think you're aware that last month there was an unusual situation where, uh, quite a lot of the tenants got, uh, legal letters from <laughs> yes. about, um, being perhaps late on their rent when in fact they weren't or not paying additional charges that were suddenly on their rent bills. and. You know, you almost had the feeling that all these agreements were reached and now let's try and harass the tenants out. I mean, what, what was your take on that? Yeah, you know, it's hard. That is something that we have raised with the left ref people in this new line of communication. Um, and, and I can't say that we got a satisfactory response. It was a, you know, a polite in tone response, but not necessarily a, a you know, satisfactory and substance response. Uh, it, it appears that what um, uh, the landlord is doing is that they've computerized their rent collection system in a way that anybody who has not paid rent by the second or third of the month automatically gets one of these threatening letters. Even though under our leases, you have until the 10th to pay the, the, the rent without penalty. Um, uh, we, in our communications with the left right people, have explained that this seems counterproductive to everything and common sense, because presumably they're paying these people to send out these letters, which come out, by the way, by certified mail, as well as on your door. And, um, you know, it's just crazy. Um, we haven't received a satisfactory response as to what anybody's mindset is in doing that. Um, uh, and uh, it, it seems, you know, doubly crazy in these pandemic times I, I have no explanation to give other than uh, what what you've seen kathy lots probably half the building got those letters i mean it, it, it was it was crazy it was crazy okay okay well that that is crazy yeah makes no sense. yeah that makes that makes no sense whatsoever at all, and I don't getting allowed to go forward between that. But uh, if there's no assistance, I can say thank you to Jeff and and to and to Robin. I think but Robin has our hands up. I, I, I was just going to say that Robin, okay. numerous people on the DPTA board got those notices also. So <laughs> there was a no yeah. special selection. That's so funny. Wow. They're a little crazy because you're right. Jeff. That costs money. Yeah. It's stupid. It's stupid on their part. It's and stupid. They could wait till the 10th at least and then send it out because. Yeah. Yeah. That's anyway. What are you going to do? But anything else? Am I missing anything? No, I mean, that's all the report I got. I don't know. There may be other questions, but. Speak up because I'm not seeing any hands but if anybody wants to speak up say something but thank you i think that 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 is very helpful thank you i see no questions so i'm going to go on to the next thing which is nick Spordone. you are up with your report yeah i'm keeping you to 10 minutes i'm sorry i'm sorry this is still earlier than i to get on i know i know but you've got 10 minutes and then lucian's going to talk to us and then we might actually be able to get off this call at a decent hour for a change all right um, I'm going to go through it, uh, and I think I can probably keep, keep it to close to 10 minutes there. Uh, Lucian, do you want to queue up the, um, 
the report, if you'd be so kind. Good man. Okay, uh, well, good evening, everyone. Nice to be with you again on uh, kind of a, the end of a long, end of a long, long week so far, but uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed for uh, good news still. Running through this briefly, as we have been leading off uh, every report with since uh, April, is our uh, COVID update. This is pulled uh, essentially from the New York State's website. We just want to make sure that folks are keeping up with the latest information about the pandemic, which we are uh, regrettably and sadly still not out of. Uh, you've seen the signs again. I'll say it as I always do. Please continue to wear masks when you're outside and keep a safe distance from everyone. We have information there, obviously, about um, quarantine, different information from states, how to file a complaint about uh, businesses or uh, places of work that are not uh, abiding by health and safety regulations. Um, and then obviously you have a link there at the bottom, at the top of page two, the last bullet under number one. Lucian, as always, you can click there to receive your daily coronavirus updates by email. Just simply click there and add your email address. Uh, In-person uh, parks programming, number two there. As you know, we are continuing our, uh, our uh, parks programming in a limited capacity, obviously through uh, November 21st, uh, at least that is uh, as far as we can go through November until the, the weather starts to turn on us. Indoor programming is not yet something we are going to do, obviously, given all the considerations around um, the pandemic, but we will continue outdoor programming permitting through the 21st and the, uh, the newsletter that you all have all, I think, received if you're on our list is linked there. And then with the specific classes as well, Tuesdays, nature and play, Wednesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays um, with the particular classes linked there for your information. As always, again, programs are first come, first serve. We're going to uh, limit the number of, uh, of uh, folks we can attend at uh, individuals are maintain, remaining six feet apart between households if you're attending with someone from your own household. Obviously, that's, that's a different kettle of fish. Okay, moving on, number three, as you all have seen, and thank you all for the support, there's now public arts installation on Belvedere Plaza, which thanks to our programming team um, and others throughout the authority, we've really been able to activate as a public space, you recall, that's a space that we've done um, kind of in non-pandemic salad, our non-pandemic salad days, we used to do Strings on Hudson there in August, which was the open air classical music concerts on Thursdays in August. And we recently had the Blessing of the Boats, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council installation there um, over the summer. Now we have uh, Mildred Howard, who is a renowned mixed media artist, there with her installation on loan from the Sacramento County Airports, Department of Airports. It's called The House That Shall Not Pass for Any Color But Its Own. Really a stunning installation. It's interactive. You can walk into it. A number of people obviously walking into it are limited. You have to wear a mask when you're obviously outdoors uh, and close by to anyone else. But it really is a stunning display, uh, and the idea is when you walk in, you're all the same to you, uh, thanks uh, and, uh, as a function of the purple glass. So it's a really nice installation, kind of out of the way, so it's not blocking traffic, but a really kind of serene spot to take in and enjoy. And that will be on view here in Battery Park City uh, through summer 2021, at the least. Next, in the realm of public art, on October 12th, as we know, Governor Cuomo unveiled the new Mother Cabrini Memorial to some great acclaim. That location there is just south of South Cove along the Battery Park City Esplanade with a direct view of Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty, which of course for the patron saint of immigrants is a very fitting uh, location. There's some more information there in the report about uh, the materiality uh, uh, and about Mother Cabrini herself. And there's obviously to um, to the release, you will note on the Battery Park City Authority website as well. You don't have to go to it now, but next time you're there, if you go to museums and memorials, there's also a new tab added there um, that will describe the Mother Cabrini Memorial in some more detail, along with the rest of the museums and memorials in Battery Park City. Okay, scrolling down, you'll see that's a that's a great looking picture, and you'll see some familiar faces there, along with the caption "Triumphant Trio." I want to thank Tammy Meltzer uh, and Justine especially for coming out on actually what turned out to be a really nice uh, Saturday morning 
Um, but Rockefeller Park, I am very pleased to report at long last is back open, fully renovated and opened up the community uh, officially on Friday the 16th. It was a bit of a rainy day, so we had to hold off our kind of our meet and greet until the next morning. But the full restoration project is now complete. Thank you again to Justine uh, and Tammy for coming out that morning. There's a picture of them with BJ on that, that Saturday. We had a really nice day there with, uh, with some of the neighborhood children. And uh, we're happy to turn this back over to the public. We hope all our families in Battery Park City and beyond enjoy it. So thanks everyone for all the support and patience there. I know it's been a bit of a long slog. I'll also take this opportunity to remind folks, uh, Lucia, if you could run down to the next page, Nick, as you're doing that, did the, le the there was one slide that was missing or something that was had to be installed? Has that been one slide still has to come in. That uh, I don't think it's quite yet. I'll have an update on Friday. I can shoot you guys it. It's in the corner it of the. That was one that was on the left. Uh, the rest of it's open. Yeah. No, you guys did a great job. It's lovely. So thank you. Thank you for getting it open. No, that, 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 thank uh, thank Gwen Austin and the real property team and all the folks who did the work there. Um, Lucian, real quick, just scrolling back up very quickly. This is the fourth and final of the playgrounds we've actually been uh, able to renovate since 2019 so you guys will recall we did a lot of reporting on this last year but kowski plaza playground uh was redone the water feature at west thames park on the upper right and then of course the ps89 playground was opened uh for the start of the school year uh last year in 2019. so thank you for that the sustainability plan we covered uh last month i put it in here again as well it's uh it's quite voluminous, so um, I invite you all to take a look at it. I know Justine and Lucian will talk about actually doing a more formal presentation to the committee on this. We want to thank you again for all the community input that went into planning this. Uh, it was one of the last public sessions we had right before the pandemic hit, as it were. Um, we had first presented this back to the committee, I believe, last November or December, when we were in the process of putting it together. Um, so thank you for that, and we'll be back to you with some more information and feedback as we uh, begin executing on this uh, very ambitious plan to try to make Battery Park City carbon neutral by the middle of the century. Battery Park City blood drives continue. This has been a huge success. I spoke with Marion about this earlier today. And to announce, I kind of teased it last month, but the next Battery Park City blood drive is going to be, Lucian, that's at the, go down to page six there. The next Battery Park City blood drive is going to be Tuesday, November 17th. That's at Six River Terrace. It's run by our partners at the New York Blood Center. Thank you, as always, to them. This is going to, again, like I said, going to be our, our fifth session since uh, since we've kind of been engaged in this pandemic. We've done, we did two in June, one in July, and one in September. Got nearly 350 uh, donations in that time. So thanks again to everyone who participated, especially all our Battery Park City residents and partners and folks who are coming from across downtown um, to participate, and especially to the Battery Park City seniors. I know Marianne and uh, Fran Dixon especially were uh, key to getting this uh, this idea started. So thanks to them. Um, Battery Park City resiliency project updates. Um, I, what I wanted to note uh, certainly was uh, the we, we did a report um, at LMCR quarterly update session at the Environmental Protection Committee meeting in uh, October. I was on the 19th with the full LMCR team from EDC and the Mayor's Office of uh, Sustainability. Um, that report, I don't actually have yet from the Mayor's Office. When I do, I'm actually going to link it into my report here. And this report itself is, of course, posted on our site. But that had updates on all of our projects. Um, we make it a point to tick down each of these uh, as we go um, each month. On the Battery Park City Ball Fields and Community Center, it's the last one there on that page. As a note, this is actually going to be something that will be coming your way. Lucian, I'll be reaching out to you on this, and Diana probably. Um, the good news on the Battery Park City Ball Fields is that we are very close to be a, a being able to uh, knock on wood, begin construction on those ball fields. As you'll recall, we have some temporary flood protection measures there in the form of muscle walls that will sustain us through the end of uh, storm season, which is the end of this month. Um, but with any luck, we'd like to have the interim solution built and constructed out by time next storm season is next next August or so. In the interim, um, we are in the process of working through the revocable consent with the city department, of transportation, and small business services for a small strip of land of the ball fields that technically is on city land. It's kind of a perfunctory, um, but. Uh, 
we want to make sure that we're going through that process with the city and the community board will see that uh, application when it comes through. Nothing new than what you've already seen in terms of the designs, but that'll be coming your way shortly. Okay, wildlife census we've done. We keep that in every month. Strategic plan the same. Um, neighborhood policing we've mentioned as part of the security report, obviously. Um, I want to take a moment here uh, on the census 2020. Pollution. That's at the bottom of uh, page eight. Thanks everyone and Battery Park City, especially for the great work in getting your census uh, forms filled out. As we know, the final deadline was Friday the 16th. You all received. You received that blast email from me, obviously, in the days leading up to that. We were really pleased and honored to work with Community Board 1 leadership and the local Census Bureau officials to really try to pound the pavement and get uh, those census forms filled out. And I'm pleased to report that the final New York City self-response rate was up to nearly 62% against this New York State rate of 64%. Uh, percent. Pretty good. What's especially notable, as you'll see at the bottom there, is that the Census Bureau itself was only projecting about a 58% response rate by uh, by New York City. And we were able to, uh, by dint of the hard work of a lot of people, I know led by Julie Menon and some other folks around the community and city to get that up um, well, in, well in excess of that. And importantly, um, more than some other major large American cities, I've listed out a few there. So we had a higher and better percentage rate uh, response than Chicago, Orlando, Dallas, Boston, Houston, Philadelphia, Miami, and Newark, to name a few. Uh, and I have some additional reading there if you'd like to, to uh, read up there. Uh, security updates we did. Thank you again, Pat, and everyone here for the updates. Lost and found contact information and composting. Board meeting schedule, we have two left for the year. And we mentioned this very briefly before. I think Cora mentioned it. But the first precinct community council meetings are very helpful um, for those who attend. As we know, and I announced last month, they have gone virtual now in the age of uh, COVID, at least for the foreseeable future. Confirmed with the police department today that uh, tentatively speaking, at least the next uh, community council meeting should be Thursday, December 3rd. They aim to do these things the last Thursday of every month, roughly, with the last one being October 29th. But since November is the month with Thanksgiving in it, it looks like it now may be December. But uh, First Precinct's very good about tweeting these things out. I will send you guys a link as well. I think, Justine, you've been attending some of them as well, but they're really, it's really a nice opportunity to get some time with the commanding officer of the precinct. Uh, and it's essentially an open forum for folks to bring up any concerns they may have regarding public safety uh, concerns in the community, including I know homelessness is a, is a big issue. Traffic's always a big issue, um, et cetera. So that's it. I was able to go through that, I think, in fairly good. short order. Thank you, everyone. And um, happy to be with you here as always. All right. I Oh, good. You can hear me. Maybe. I see my little light spiking up. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I appreciate your report. Um, anybody have any questions about anything? I feel like Alice Blank in the. In the um, uh, resiliency committee really does follow up very well with the. Um, what's going on with resiliency and what's even what's going on with battery park city. So just reiterating a lot of the things that she says. Make sure there's always going to be some sort of contact and continuation with the city and whatever's going on on the edges yep. to make sure well, that's it, what you're doing. Um, and um, that's kind of it. The only thing else would be to reiterate what, what Tammy said or has said in the past about um, Justine, can you hear us? Now it's back. Sorry, maybe. Maybe it's back. It's okay. Yeah, I'm I can so hear you. Yes, yeah, I can you. hear you. Can, can you hear sorry. Me? I am. Yep, I can hear you guys now. Okay. I'm just going to stop because my computer may or may not keep going. So I will thank you. And if nobody has any questions, or if you have any questions, speak up. Don't wait for me to call on you. I see no questions. I see no questions from the attendees. Oh, Barbara Ireland has a question. Can we call on her and, and, and uh, let her speak? Oh, hey, Barbara. 
I I thought we were going to talk about 421A affordable housing. That's next, I think, yeah. right, Tim? Uh, yes. Yeah. That is next, exactly. That is, oh, you can't hear me, but that is next. Yes. Um, yes, if you can hear me now. Um, yes, Barbara, we are talking about that now. If we're done with, with Nick, we can move on to Lucian talking about 421A and affordable housing, and let's go to there. Lucian, you take it, and um, I will hopefully be able to hear everybody. Sorry, right, everybody, you've caught me at an interesting time. I am halfway through a diaper change for my son. Um, so, uh, so why don't you finish that? <laughs> yeah, can you give me just like a, a one minute? Because I'm going to get ball necks all over the uh, trackpad if I. Uh... Yes, no, no. Finish the finish the diaper change. Yes. So funny. Um, but all right, thank you. This this worked. I hope that Patrick was happy to go first, and I, and I think this went well. Um, does anybody have anything to add in about anything that's been going on so far? I think not. Um, so, while Lucian is changing diapers, um, the reason for having the 421A, 421G affordability um, discussion is to kind of give us all a bit of information and knowledge about what these what these uh, laws are, what we can expect going forward from them, if anything, and as they are all now starting to come to expirations. What we can do, because I would, I, I think it's 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 for a resolution or whatever else that's going to be done in the quality of life committee, not our committee. It's not just Battery Park City. This is the whole all of New York. Um, but I think we have to do better. I think our elected officials have to do better in framing laws. The fact that they would, the fact of the of the um, affordability protections being expiring puts a cap on how long people can live in their homes. And I think that that is just wrong. And I think that we really need to come together as all community boards and, and start realizing that we cannot make um, our homes subject to such huge increases or whatever. Um, and even if you know it's coming, sometimes you can't make changes. So um, I think we need to do better with our, the way our laws are written, but we can't do better until we understand what they are. So um, I'm hoping. What perfect timing! There you go. I'm hoping Lucian's ready because I've got nothing else to say. Yeah, that's a great, great segue. Uh, hi everyone. I'm Lucian. I'm the district manager of CB1. I'm not. I am not uh, by any stretch uh, a housing expert. Uh, I have worked in housing. I was once an urban planner for the Manhattan Borough President, and um, you know there was a that was when uh, 421A was going to be renewed. And uh, so there's a, quite a bit of conversation around it then. So I picked up a lot of uh, background. Um, you'll have to excuse the baby in the background. Um, that's Nico. So the 421A program is uh, it's an incentive program for, for developers um, that who build multifamily housing on land that's vacant, predominantly vacant or underutilized. Um, it's, it's, it's chiefly a way to help projects pencil out, which is a, a industry term for um, uh, creating a development that that is a profitable development. And uh, in hearing developers describe it, and this is this is not particularly my perspective, but just to give you an, a perspective from that side is that that's that's usually uh, the, the, the difference between condos and rentals is uh, is if 421 a can be applied to a project. And and I, I think that it definitely there's a, a need to really explore the the mechanics of it <coughs> and how it uh, how it gets worked into pro formas for buildings. But the the important thing that we know about 421A is that um, you know since the 70s when it was first put into the New York State uh, 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 tax uh, tax provisions, which is you know part 421A. Um, is that uh, later on it, it, it took on affordable housing requirements, and those have morphed uh, as time goes on. So different buildings which have 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 421A components to it don't necessarily have the same restrictions or protections of 
uh, their affordable units or the, the same requirements for the, the, the provision of affordable units on site. So, um, the, the, the best example would be, um, Xtel's, uh, uh, 157, um, uh, uh, super tall building, um, that, that really caused the last, um, uh, conversation around, um, what buildings in Manhattan's core ought to provide to people when they, there's a tax abatement that's applied for 15 to 25 years. And, um, and, and I believe 157 was, a, you know, kind of given a special write in to the, the 421A at the time, which didn't, which made it so it wasn't required to provide affordable housing on site, which, um, you know, is a, is a real, it's a real miss for providing housing in, in, in Manhattan. So, uh, so, you know, uh, in looking backwards at 421A protections and provisions, um, it, it is a quite a, a different story than looking forwards because the programs can be seen to be so different um, as time goes on. So that's that's kind of a, a you know a very general uh, uh, overview, uh, but it is it is related to 421G. You know these are all types of of of, of, uh, of tax incentives uh, for the development of housing. Um, it, it can be compared to J51, um, but the the details and, and really the nitty gritty of it, it's something that uh, we would have to bring in an affordable housing expert to really get into that. Um, uh, but uh, I, I hope this is enough to start a conversation on the committee level about 421A. So Lucian, thank you. I, I apologize that I've like been moving around and shaking my computer because I'm trying to find constant signal, which means I missed half of your explanation, but thankfully you told me a little bit in the beginning. Um, I'd love to know and hear from questions from, from our board. Um, if anybody has anything to say, plus Barbara Ireland wanted to hear about this, so I'm wondering if she has any questions particularly to ask. Um, I do. So Can I would tell me which buildings in Battery Park City has 421A or G? And I also am hearing from the Solera that they're going co-op. Nick, can you speak to that? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Nick, can you speak to that or, or give us some any information? I know I had spoken to BJ about it, and he said that he was aware of, of all the buildings that were 421A. Um, oh, he was oh, aware oh. of the deadlines in Battery Park City, not I'm sorry, just no, go ahead. I also believe that the bylaws of the land lease uh, in Battery Park City does not allow a co op to exist. Okay, no, I apologize, I had a family issue. I'll step in since we can't hear Justine. Which yep. buildings in Battery Park City are 421, 421A and G? And I understand from directly from Albanese that Soler is going co-op, which I understand is against the policy of the bylaws. Um, 421A and G? I don't know. I don't have. I don't have it uh, on me now. I know in Battery Park City we have a number of 421A light buildings. I don't have a breakout right in front of me now about what's 421A and G, but I can get that back to you guys. Um, my understanding about uh, restrictions are on condo conversions, not necessarily co-op conversions. Um, Which was their tricky way of dealing with it and jumping in. Is, is this a loophole? I think it's a loophole. Go ahead. It I'm sorry. Needs to be Sega. stopped. We we do not have a provision in Battery Park City Authority's land lease to have a conversion to co-op. I understand it's against the bylaws. Is that correct, Nick, or not correct? 
I look again. I, I don't sitting here right now. I, I would be out of my depth if I were going to try to comment with any with any uh, degree of. Uh, okay, I understand. This but I can follow up. I can yeah, follow can up. you sure. get back? Can you get back? Sure. Sure. I, I can. If you guys can all hear me, I can follow up about the the solar vis a vis proposed co op conversion. I understand you, it's not the first that other buildings are going to go co op. Okay, I'll I'll check and see. I don't know. I don't have it in front of me, but I can confirm. I can check for you all. Okay, so I, of course, missed everything and I'm still missing everything. Yeah. Oh, here we go. I missed everything, which is fine. I was going to ask, will I have the chance to ask um, that you come back and report next month, Nick? Number one, let us know if the co op is possible or not possible, because I mm -hmm. think it is a loophole. I think that, that they were kind of creative. I think the Battery Park City Authority said no condos, not thinking that they would try to go co op. So um, I'd love to know what, if anything, can be done to prevent that. And, and and what conversations that, that you can share are happening right now, because I think the people who live there would like to know. Step one and step two, I'd love to have an accounting of the 421 A G, whatever the hell it is, the affordable housing in Battery Park City. So that we can have a focus on it and then um, eventually this is going to go to the quality of life committee because this is really more their bailiwick, but. Um, it's a vest, we have a vested interest in preserving affordable housing in Battery Park City. And the first step is getting that information. So, so Barbara, thank you for bringing it up. I, I, yeah, I don't know if we can wait until next month, though. They're actively telling all new leasees that they're going co op and closing the lobby for renovations and converting units. Oh, wow. And how many units are empty now? <sighs> Well, what oh, you would all like to know? Yeah, you don't know. Okay. Um, wow. Okay, Nick, you get back to me um, next week. Sure. Would that be helpful? I mean, this way we can at least see what we can do because the quality of life committee is not yeah, next week. Yeah, when do they meet this month? They week the third, I guess, Thursday or something. I have to look it up, but it's not next week. It's the week after. I think it's the 17th. 11th, 12th, okay. 18th, maybe. Whatever date is. Okay. Yeah. Justine. Right. I'm just going to speak up. Just, just, yes, just do, Bob. go ahead. I didn't, I didn't mean to inter interrupt Robin. Uh, I just was watching my hand be up for a while. I just wanted to make a comment. Yeah. Uh, the comment I'd like to make is that, um, is that Tom Goodkind um, it had a housing company and it's been planned for some time with his wife taking it over and it's never really gotten anywhere. But I know that that there were some completed lists of all of the different kinds of affordable units that are around and that should be uh, the community board should take the responsibility of uh, unearthing those things and reviving. The other thing that I think is important for us to work with is the answer to the question with the with the kind of with the kind of new financial stress stresses and possible homelessness, do we have any record or is there any institution that's trying to figure out how many people there are in Battery Park City that might be under financial duress and might be facing anything like eviction or extreme stresses? And can we as a community board find ways to work to find out who those people are and to help work with them, even if it's just to make um, just to make referrals for them so we can help them along uh, uh, or maybe maybe yeah. Nick is in a position to kind of help with that kind of uh, heavy lifting. The two good points, um, two very good points. Um, 
One thing I want to say to answer the first one, I was asking who was responsible within the quality of life committee for doing the housing subcommittee or whatever. And I was told by Tammy that it's actually Pat Moore. It's, it's not Jill. It's Pat who's in charge. So I'm going to be pushing Pat and Lucian. Remind me to do that, to push Pat, to see what we can do. Yeah. I think I, I, I think that um, I think that the person who had the information and was supposed to go forward with was uh, was Jill and I, obviously I think I've watched that Pat Moore has become more responsible for it, but even in, in any case, the problems are current and desperate, I think. And so it's really important to make the make an initiative and make it a priority. It is, and I think you were saying by reading your lips, I think you were saying um, that Jill has the list. She probably does because Tom had the list, so that would be a good thing. But let's talk um, offline because this is not going too well. Robin, did you want to say know. something? I said that. I said that. Yeah. yeah. Said that. Um, Robin, did you want to say something? Yes, thank you. Uh, I just ahead. wanted to say something about the Solaire. Um, this is the first I'm hearing about it. Uh, I don't know what's in the ground lease um, in terms of the creation of co-ops, but it's certainly not something that I would say long-term residents or probably the people who created the ground lease anticipated. Correct. Uh, remember that um, Solaire was built as the first green residential building, and it was built as a 9310, as I recall. Um, the idea that it would become a co-op sort of flies in the face of, I think, uh, what many of us are hoping for uh, within the neighborhood. Um, Nick, a question for you. Uh, presumably, any kind of conversion requires the approval of the Battery Park City Authority Board. Has that been uh, discussed at the board at this point? Yeah. So... I don't think this is a conversation I know that Tammy and I have had. And yes, because I know we don't had believe before. that co-op conversions require approval of the authority. Condo I thought any period. change in um, I thought any change in composition like a rental to a condo. So, so, a, so a condo conversion does, and we have made it abundantly clear that we are not approving any condo conversions in Battery Park yeah. City. Co-ops are structured, as I understand it, I am, again, far from an expert here, but are structured differently. And I don't believe it requires BPCA approval. But I will, again, come back uh, yeah. to Justine again, and again. to the Quality of Life Committee with what, uh, what, 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 with what a better sense of uh, a more complete picture. Right. To, what you kind of can't do. That's a better way of putting it, right? To, to yeah, the, I would have to say that uh, it's alarming. It's very it's alarming. alarming. And uh, if there's not a requirement, there should be. And if there's not a requirement, attention should be paid to this. And this should be um, amplified in the community and beyond because we are trying to protect the very small amount of affordable housing there is and preserve the community. And this is, in my opinion, not a good way to do that. So. Now, Robin, you are correct. This is not the first time that I'm hearing about the co-op possibility. Um, and I know Tammy has raised it and spoken with BJ about it, and we need to follow up. So, so Nick, I'm going to hold you to that, to come up to some, at least, so we can have a conversation about it at the Quality of Life Committee, if yeah. that's where it can go. It makes, it makes in, sense in advance, in advance of a conversion. Yeah. I mean, is there well, a red herring well, that's been issued, or...? Can't hear you. Hmm. Anyone? Hello? I can hear you, Nick. Okay. I'll just bye. All right. I just wanted to jump in for a second since we have a, a, a pause and just say that I, I think it might be possible that Battery Park City ha has a list of affordable housing and that it would be good if Nick could 
um, could research that and get back to us on whether that's the case or not, and whether or not they can help work with us to update it and also to find out what new problems and challenges we might have coming up. Yes, I think that would be a really great idea, and I think we've asked for that. Um, I yeah, think the four twenty one a. Yes, we can come back with that. That's a separate issue yeah, from the exactly. solar issue, which is something we want to do in the interim. Yes, exactly. Right. Okay. It's two different things. I think that the four twenty one a list can wait at least till the 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 uh, quality of life committee or our next meeting. But um, the solar is is more urgent. We need to jump on that. Um, and I have to tell you that if nobody has any more questions, I think I am done trying to keep this meeting going when I can't hear anything. And that's not anybody's fault but mine. But um, does anybody have anything to add or questions? Um, I don't see any in the attendees. I don't see any on the board. So I would say if nobody has anything to say, we can call this meeting closed. Can we do that, Lucian? Okay. Second. <laughs> All right, are we good? Very good. Very good. All right. Thank you all for being here. I don't know. I don't know that um, I will. You'll even hearing me, but um, I appreciate it. And I really do. Nick, I'm going to hold you to following up with me. Um, in the next you know, week or so. And I appreciate everybody. Oh, yeah. being. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. To Solaire, we're not crazy about conversions either. Clearly, that's not uh, part of what we're trying to do, which is to try to preserve and where we can expand affordability. So, um, I'm with you. It's part of our strategic approach, and um, I'll be back to you for sure, so we can discuss it if need be at uh, Quality of Life. Okay, Justine, with the with the uh, the audio. Justine, if you want me to, <laughs> if you want me to cut the recording, use your hands. Bye 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 bye. bye. Good yeah, God! She's good. She's good. I, I, yeah, she's yeah, good. I know. I think it's a sign to close up because I got nothing here. I think it's time, um, Lucian, mm -hmm. to turn off the thing. Turn off. I think we're all good.